section two. So using the addition rule for disjoint events. So first of all, what is the disjoint event? Two disjoint events, um, two events are disjoint if they have no outcomes in common. Another name for disjoint events is mutually exclusive events. So remember the breakdown of this vocabulary. We have some sort of an experiment. Maybe that experiment is roll one die. Roll one die. Then we have our sample space, which is made up of simple events. And so the simple events are the possible outcomes. Maybe we get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. So let's say this is the easiest game in Las Vegas. You just got a dealer there with one die, six-sided, and you just put money down on one of the numbers. $100 on three, he rolls it, it's a four, you lose. Okay. $20 on two, he rolls it, it's a, seven, it's a six, you lose. Right? Um, so um, let's say we have a couple of given events. Let's say I put some money down, and I put money down on the number two and the number five. Those are my favorite numbers. So that's event E, two and five. It's made up of two simple events, or two outcomes, two and five. Okay, let's say that one of my friends bet on the numbers one, two, and three. Those are his favorite numbers. And let's say another friend, C, wagered on the numbers four and three. So those are our bets. I put money down on two and five, my friend put money down on one, two, and three, and my other friend made put money on four and three. Okay, so um, event E and event C have nothing in common. They don't have any common outcomes, so we say that E and C are mutually exclusive or disjoint events. They have no common outcomes. On the other hand, E and B fail to be disjoint. They have something in common. There's a two there and there's a two there, right? They have something in common. And so does B and C, they have something in common as well, right? So in, in this situation, the E and the C are the ones that have mutually, are, are mutually exclusive outcomes. Got it, got it? So they have no overlap. There's no way that uh, E and C can both happen at the same time. There's no individual roll of the die, result of rolling one die, that would result in both E and C being winners, right? We could have E and B being winners at the same time, but two roll, then we both win. Got it? Good? Okay, we can express this with Venn diagrams. A Venn diagram is a visual representation of our sample space and events. So we like to do a big rectangle to represent our entire sample space. So the whole thing is there. Sometimes we just leave it like that, or sometimes we write down uh, all the numbers in there as well. So now what we like to do is put circles in there to represent the various events. So I could have event E there, and then I could have event C over there. And event E has the number 2 and the number 5. And event B, I'm sorry, C has the number 4 and the number 3. Right, so then I would put down the other options. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. 1 and 6 are there. So this is an example of just, use, uh, of just uh, writing down event E and event C. So the entire sample space includes everything, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. All possible outcomes are described somewhere, and now I'm using this circle to represent event E, and this circle to represent event C. They have nothing in common, there are no common outcomes, so they are disjoint, mutually exclusive. On the other hand, if I wrote another Venn diagram that included all three, then I have an event E here, and I have an event B here, and I'd have an event C here, and then, let's see, I would have the numbers uh, 5 here, and 2 there, and then C has 3 in common, and 4, and then this has a 1, and the only one missing is a 6. Okay. So, notice the overlap with the B here, 
It has a 2 in common with both E and B. 2 is common to both... 2 is common to both E and B. So it's the overlap of the 2. Um, and 3 is common to both B and C. So it's the overlap of those two. So that's why B and C are not disjoint, and E and B are not disjoint. We don't have a fancy word for not disjoint, you just say not disjoint. Right? Disjoint means they have nothing in common, no common outcomes. Uh, mutually exclusive is another way of saying it, no common outcomes. But if they have something in common, there is something in the overlap, then we'd say that they fail to be disjoint or they fail to be mutually exclusive. Any questions about those guys? So here's a situation, for instance, if we have the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, so suppose, for example, that there's a bag of chips and each chip is labeled 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You throw it in a bag, you shake it up, you're going to pick one out and identify the number. And so again, you're making wages. So somebody bets that E is either the 0, the 1, or the 2. And somebody bets that the F is either an 8 or a 9. So we have 0, 1, 2, da, 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 all the way up to 9. Uh, event E is that it's a, a 0, a 1, or a 2. And event F is it's either an 8 or a 9, then we can use that Venn diagram to describe our situation. So the giant rectangle represents all possible outcomes. Event E is the purple one in there, and it has 0, 1, or 2. And event F is either the 8 or the 9. And again, they have nothing in the overlap, nothing in common. So we say that event E and event F are disjoint or mutually exclusive. Good. Questions? 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 So what's the probability of E? The probability of E is going to be equal to the number of things in E. So probability of E is equal to N of E over N of S. And so it's 3 over 10, or 30%. And the probability of F is equal to the number of things in F divided by the number of things in our sample space, which is equal to 2 out of 10, or 20%. So now what if I wanted to find the probability of E or F? So I put money on 0, 1, or 2. My friend, he put money on 8 or 9. One chip is going to be drawn and, you know, call out the winner. Is it possible that both of us win at the same time? No, because there's nothing in the overlap. There's no numbers uh, that are common to both wages. Um, so either he wins or I win. So what's the probability that he wins or I win? Well, either the 0, the 1, or the 2, means I win, or the 8 or the 9. So I can tell that there's 5, right? There should be 5 ways for either him or I to win. So 5 out of 10 seems like the right answer, right? Okay, so the probability of E or F is equal to the number of things in E or F divided by the number of things in S. So the number of things in E or S, I'm counting, it's the 1, the 2, the 3, the 8, or the 9. There are five things in the number of things of e, in events E or F. And again, the number of things in the sample space is 10, so the probability is 50%. Got it? Good. Notice that in this particular case, we could have just added the probability of E and the probability of F. The probability of E is 30%, the probability of F is 20%, and if we add them together, 20 plus 30 is 50%. Okay? So this is valid as long as the two events are mutually exclusive. When uh, two events are mutually exclusive and you want to find the probability of one or the other, then we can just add them together. That leads to the, this rule, the addition rule for disjoint events. So if E and F are disjoint or mutually exclusive events, then the probability of E or F is equal to the probability of E plus the probability of F. Okay? And that's disjoint. That means they have nothing in the overlap, no, nothing in common between the two. 
And then we can extend this out to many events. If there were many events, they were all disjoint, and we want to find the probability of E or F or K or M, and they all represented mutually exclusive events, then we can find the events individually and add them together. Right? So in general, if E, F, G, dot, 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 each represented um, mutually exclusive uh, events, they have nothing in common, then the probability of E or F or G or so on and so forth is equal to the sum of each of those probabilities. Good? Question? Okay. For instance, this table here shows the number of rooms in housing units in the US. So the probability model to the right shows the distribution of the number of rooms in homes in the United States. So what is it saying? Um, that the number... Um, if we randomly select one house in the United States, the probability that it has five rooms is 21.9%. Or another way of saying it, 21.9% of all homes in the United States have five rooms, right? Bedroom, kitchen, living room, I don't know, library, sauna, I don't know, what other rooms you got? Or you can repeat, bedroom one, bedroom two, bedroom three, bathroom one, bathroom two, that kind of thing. Okay, so verify that this is a, prob a proper probability model. Okay, so all possible outcomes are listed. Yeah, you can't have zero rooms, right? It wouldn't really be a house anymore. You have zero rooms. So I think one room is the least you can have. You can't have point rooms, right? Depends on your description of rooms, I suppose. Um, I think technically they require a, a window and a door for it to be a room. Otherwise, it's like a closet or something. Uh, so I think it has to have its own door and its own window in order for it to be considered a room. Um, so one is the smallest, two, three, four. And then notice at the end they went nine or more, the rest. So it looks like we've covered every possible outcome. And then those probabilities over there, well, they're all between 0 and 1, so that satisfies that first condition. And the second condition is that they all add up to, they all have to add up to 100% or they add up to 1, and that does work here. It is a proper probability distribution. So, what is the probability that a randomly selected housing unit has two or three rooms? So, you got to first ask yourself, are these disjoint events? If we let 1 represent the number of, um, say, 1 room, Oh, sorry, two rooms. So if we let, uh, let A represent uh, two rooms and B represent three rooms, is it possible that those two events have something in common? Is there an overlap? Meaning that if I randomly select one house, is it possible that that house has two rooms but it also has three rooms? Mm, you got to be careful with the definition. Um, we're talking about the total number of rooms, right? So I think we have to be careful with that. When we say it has five rooms, we mean it's the total number of rooms, not that it has, you know, sort of a running number of rooms. So if the total number of rooms is three, then the total number of rooms can't be two. Is that, is that clear? Okay. So then what's the probability that we have one randomly selected housing unit and it has either A or B, we want to use that notation, or we can go back to saying two or three. We just have to be careful of what we mean by this, right? The total number of rooms is two, or the total number of rooms is three. And because there is no overlap, there's no way that they both happen at the same time, uh, we know that we could just find the probability of A plus the probability of B. Or the probability of two plus the probability of three. So the probability of two or 3 is equal to the probability of 2 plus the probability of 3. And we have our table over there to tell us that those odds are 3.2% and 9.3% for a total of 12.5%. There's a 12.5% probability that one randomly selected house has either 2 or 3 rooms. Another way of saying it is in all the United States, 12.5% of all homes in the United States have either 2 or 3 rooms. We can extend it to another one. What is the probability that a randomly selected house has one or two or three rooms? So again, we're talking about total number of rooms. 
So you can't have a house that has a total number of one room and also a total number of three rooms. Right? So we can't have uh, more than one happen at the same time. They're mutually exclusive. So therefore, we can uh, find them individually and add them together. Probability of one or two or three is equal to the probability of one plus the probability of two plus the probability of three, which means we add those all together and we get 0.135 or 13.5%. The probability that one randomly selected house in the United States is selected and it has one or two or three rooms is equal to 13.5%. Or equally, we can say 13.5% of all homes in the United States have one or two or three rooms. Good. Any questions? What's the most likely result? Five, right? One randomly selected house, the most likely outcome is five. What is that? Uh, kitchen, bathroom, living room, and one bedroom. One, did I say bathroom already? Yeah. Okay. So two bedroom, one bath, house is the most common thing. Probably, unless you have one bedroom, two baths. Possible. People like like a master bedroom, and then there's also a bathroom for the service. Well, now, yeah, that's, that's where statistics gets hard because you have to get really specific on your definitions of things. What exactly constitutes a room? What exactly constitutes a bathroom? Is it a half bath? Is a full bathroom? Right, so then you have to get you know very specific on what you define things to be. Uh, so that's part of the problem or the difficulties of the challenges of statistics. You've got to be very specific about what you're talking about so that everybody understands the same definitions of things when you're describing them. So now a more generic rule is this. Uh, for any two events, E and F, the probability of E and F is equal to the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of E and F. This is very similar to the previous one. What's different about it? Here, we don't have that condition of the being disjoint. In other words, in the prior rule, if E and F were disjoint, let's put it back up here. Ah. If E and F were disjoint, if they have nothing in common, then all we have to do is add them together. But if that is taken out, if there exists a possibility that there is something in the overlap, they are not disjoint, then we have to take that into consideration. And the way we do that is to subtract whatever they have in common. The probability that E and F both happen at the same time. Okay? So, for instance, uh, for example, let's say that we roll two dice, and we're looking at the possible outcomes when we roll two six-sided die. Here is all possible outcomes. How many are there total? You roll two pairs of dice. Six this way, six that way, there are 36 possible outcomes, right? A one and a three, a three and a one, a four and a six, right? So there are 36 possible outcomes that, occur, that can occur when you roll uh, a pair of dice. Uh, so let's say let event E be the number of die is a two, I'm sorry, the first die is a two, and let F be the sum of the dice is less than or equal to five. These are two events. So find the probability of E or F by using the general rule. So to do that, first of all, we're gonna find the probability of E by itself, the probability of F by itself. Then we wanna find the probability of E and F together, the probability that they both happen at the same time, and then we can apply it to our rule of finding the probability of E or F, okay? So what's the probability that E occurs? E is that the first die is a two. Okay, so let's write down all the cases in which the first die is a 2. That would be the, the second row, right? Um, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6. How many are there? 6 of them, right? Over 36. So that's how we're going to find this. Probability of E is equal to the number of uh, outcomes in event E divided by the number of outcomes in event S or 6 out of 36, that reduces to 1 out of 6. Good. Now what's the probability that event F is going to happen by itself? Event F. Event F is that the sum of the dice is less than or equal to 5. So we're going to go through and figure out which ones are less than or equal to 5. So 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, those all work out in the first, the first uh, column. 
The second column, one, three, two, two, three, two, those work out. Then one, three, two, three, that's it. And then finally, one, four. And so those are all the ones that uh, satisfy that condition, that the sum of the two die is less than or equal to five. So when we find the probability, we have to count them. I counted one, two, three, four in the first uh, row. Uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I'm counting ten. Good? Okay, so that would be n of f divided by n of s, so 10 out of 36, or 5 out of 18. And finally, we have to think about all the ways that both can happen at the same time. So what kinds of, uh, what kind of results can satisfy both at the same time? Well, we said that for event E, it was the second column, right? So anything in the second column that adds up to 5 or less will work out for both of them. So it's the first three in the second column. 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3. Those three results satisfy both conditions. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. So the probability of E and F is equal to 3 out of 36. There's three ways that can happen. Right? Uh, 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3. Okay. So now we use our general formula, which is to add the probability of E plus the probability of F and subtract the probability of E and F. So we get 6 out of 36 plus 10 out of 36 minus 3 out of 36, which gives you a total of 13 out of 36. Questions, 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 questions? Okay, so... Um, this is the generic one that always applies. It's just that in those cases when E and F happen to be mutually exclusive, they can never happen at the same time. Therefore, probability of E and F happens to be zero. So if it was really up to me, if this was a book I wrote, I really wouldn't even bother with the other rule. Uh, this rule covers everything. It's just that sometimes it becomes extra simple because there's no way that they can both happen at the same time. And so that last component of P of E and F becomes zero. Did that make sense? Good, good, good. Okay, so if they are mutually exclusive or disjoint, then this formula becomes simpler and the probability of E or F becomes probability of E plus the probability of F. But if there is something in the overlap, then we have to subtract that. Now, sometimes we rely on this formula because we have to, we don't have any other options, and sometimes we can avoid it because really it just means you have to figure out all the outcomes that satisfy one condition or the other. And if we go back to over here and just count all the things that satisfy one condition or the other, we'll see that there are 13 of them. So if we go through and uh, count all the ones that satisfy one condition or the other, well, in, in row one, in row one we see that this, these uh, four right here satisfy it. So one, two, three, four, right? I'm looking at adds up to five. One, two, three, four. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. These are all the ones that add up to 5. Now the ones that the first di uh, die was a 2, but I don't want to repeat things. And I've already covered these. So I don't want to repeat them. I have 10, and then 11, 12, 13. So if you can visually count them, and don't allow yourself the option, or don't let yourself recount things more than once, then you can just count them all and see that there are exactly 13 that satisfy one or the other without repetition. Okay, so sometimes you can get away with counting, sometimes you have to use the rule, and we'll see some examples where you have to. Uh, one last thing real quick, the complement rule. So the definition of a complement, let S denote the sample space of a probability experiment, let E denote an event, then the complement of E is noted as E with a little C in the top right hand corner, corner and it uh, means that it's the complement of it, and it's all the outcomes in the sample space S that are not, not in the outcomes of E. So it's everything not in E, okay? So in terms of a Venn diagram, um, you can describe it this way. So if we have the rectangle is the entire sample space, and uh, the circle in the center E represents a particular event, then everything not in E, but is still in our sample space, is the complement of it. Sometimes we use a bar as well to represent the complement of something. 
So sometimes you'll run into capital E bar to represent the complement, and sometimes we'll have E with a complement like that. Okay? So if we're looking at the probability of E and the probability of uh, E complement, would you say they're disjoint? Probability of E and probability or event E and event E complement uh, are always disjoint, right? Sort of by definition, they have nothing in common because the way you build this is saying everything that's not in that one. That's how you build it. Uh, if we had the thing with the little chips of uh, the numbers from 0 to 9, and I have an event here, let's say I, I put money on 3 and 7, so the rest are 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 9. So here's my sample space with all numbers between 0 and 9, and here's my event E. Then the complement of event E is everything outside of event E, which would be the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, right? All the values over here. So it's the, op the, the complement of it, the opposite of it. So the probability of event E plus the probability of event C has got to be equal to 1, always, right? So they're mutually exclusive, so all we have to do is add them if we want to find the probability of one or the other. And I know that the probability of one or the other has to be equal to 100% because together they make up the entire sample space. Good? Okay, so we can use this rule right here to solve for one of the probabilities if we don't know it. So if we don't know that one, you can uh, solve by, you know, you can use simple algebra to either get probability of E complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of E, or you can get the probability of E is equal to 1 minus the probability of E complement. So one of those two versions can be helpful. Good. Questions, comments, issues? No? No? Um, real quick here, for example, according to the American Veter Veterinary, Medical, uh, Veterinary Medical Association, 31.6% of American households own a dog. What is the probability that a randomly selected household does not own a dog? So, own a dog and does not own a dog are complements of each other, right? You either own a dog or you don't own a dog. So, if we want to find the probability that an owner does not, ah, that a person does not own a dog, what we can do is use its complement. One minus the probability of owning a dog will be equal to the probability that you don't own a dog. So if we know 31.6% own a dog, then we automatically know that 68.4% do not own a dog. Good. Questions, comments, issues?